Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Height Seventh Adventist Church. We are glad that you're here. Today we have Marcos. He is one of our leaders in our church. He teaches a Sabbath school class. He is also our Adventist youth leader, and we appreciate all he does for Heights Church. You have seen him preach before, and he's going to have the sermon today in just a moment. I do have a couple announcements to make. Just a quick reminder that from 1 to 2 today, that's May the 16th, we will be having the drive through You'll be able to get a variety of Sabbath school and other uh, outreach and giving materials. You will also be able to drop all tithe and offerings and uh, other, other things as well. It's a way, one way that we can communicate with you. Uh, we're just uh, thankful and grateful for all that you've done. Just want to make a special announcement. We, uh, Many of us have been giving towards the goal of, of raising monies for our insurance bill for the Heights Church. We have done that successfully. We have made our goal, and we're thankful for it. If anyone wants to continue giving, uh, those monies will be applied to next year's um, a goal for insurance as well. We also are grateful for the food that's been coming in for the food bank. We anticipate a need from not maybe our own members, but from others outside our church needing some food. And we appreciate folks have been donating. We want to continue to collect those monies so that we can help out people uh, in, in, in need. Um, I think that's really all the announcements that I have. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Marcos. Marcos will have the opening prayer, and then he will begin his sermon. Welcome, Marcos, and thank you. Thank you, Jip. Happy Sabbath. I have a word of prayer before we start our sermon. Dear Lord God, thank you very much for this uh, blessed opportunity to come before you and uh, to speak. Lord, we ask that may you guide us and be with us. Uh, give us your spirit so that we may have a right understanding. Be with me as I speak so that may the message come out not as I want it, but as you have prepared in me. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> For today, my topic will be your day in the court. Uh, it's been said that it's better for 99 guilty men, go for one innocent to be unjustly prisoned. But what do you think? Do you think which one is worse, for a guilty to go free and punished, or the innocent for to be falsely accused and wrongly punished? No one wants the guilty criminal set free to endanger and threaten others. But do any one of us really want innocent people to be punished for something they haven't done? Have you ever been accused for something you haven't done or something that you haven't said? The answer to be is yes. Maybe you were blamed for something somebody else did or ended up taking their punishment. You knew you were innocent. Your sense of fairness and justice inside you will tell you that. But it is one thing, of course, to be falsely accused and worse to be is falsely punished. And worse is still for the innocent to be executed. In this world, we know we are guilty people who are never punished for their crimes and the innocent who are punished for the things they never did. There was a courtroom trial for a man who was uh, accused of murdering his wife, and a jury decided on a verdict of, verdict of not guilty. Some rejoice that they are convinced the guilty man is set free. Now, I have very bad news for you. Every one of us have been accused for something so truly bad. Penalty is dead, and I have even more bad news. Everyone, you are absolutely guilty at charge, and your day in the court is coming. That is certain. How do I know about this? Because the Bible tells me so. But do you know what is the worst news of exam? just as guilty as you are. And I'm also going to that court too. Let's read the book of Revelation chapter 16, verse six. It says, then I saw an angel 
flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. The Bible says these messages for every nation, tribe, language, and a group of people, and the hour of God is not an earthly court. This is on no trial of the century. This is a heaven's court. This is a trial of the ages, a final drama in the history of the world, the great controversy between good and evil, the final and fully completely settles the destinies of all mankind are settled. Daniel saw this courtroom. If we read Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I was watching in the night vision. Behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. How come? Daniel came and they brought him near before him. Can you imagine that scene? Daniel looked up into heaven, sees the supreme court of the universe, and he sees the angels, the seraphims, and he sees the ancient of days, God the Father, sitting in the supreme court of the universe. And, uh, and we continue Daniel 7, 9, and 10. I watched till the thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white, his head was like a pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. A thousand, thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. This is a magnificent, majestic, and glorious scene. Sitting in the supreme court of the universe, the Bible says the books were open. The evidence is presented. Why? What occurs in this judge? How is the drama of destinies all set up? As the sun sets on the planet Earth, you will recall the studying time in the judgment, the cleansing of sanctuary on the heavenly sanctuary in the book of Daniel chapter 8. Verse 14 said to me, for 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. In the Bible, one prophetic day equal to one literal day. 2,300 prophetic day for Daniel's time represent 2,300 years. Bible talks about cleansing of the sanctuary. There are two sanctuaries, one on the earth that is scaled and modeled, the copy pattern with it from the great original sanctuary in the heaven. 2,300 years in the future from Daniel's day, obviously, no, Jesus died. The veil in the earthly temple is split, and no longer the sacrifice of lamb is brought to the temple. Everything in the earthly temple represents a ministry in the heavenly. The lambs is slain on the earthly temple represents so Jesus, the Lamb of God, came from heaven to die on the cross for us. After the days of Jesus Christ, the lamb on the earthly sanctuary, the priest takes the blood into the sanctuary, and after that, Christ died. He is the true lamb of God. He ascended into the heavenly sanctuary at the end of this life cycle on a Jewish religious uh, cycle. The earthly sanctuary has a day of atonement, a day of judgment, an end of time, also be called a day of judgment. According to Daniel's prophecy, 2,300 years of Daniel's time would take us into the heavenly judgment just before the second coming of Christ. If we check the 2,300 years, which began 457 BC, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, the first 490 years applies to the Jewish to the baptismal of Jesus Christ on 27, 27 AD, the anointing, and through which the ministry of Jesus when Christ crucified in 31st AD, and then finally it ended on 34 AD, stoning of Stephen, where the gospel went to the Gentiles. If we take 2,300 years from 457 BC, we will come to 1844. Since 1844, we are living in a time of the end, 
a period where the Bible calls God's judgment hour, when heaven's courts are in session, which are to be settled. Acts 1735 says, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. We have entered in that, that judgment hour, the destinies of this world now being decided. What is the reason for this judgment? Why is there judgment before Christ? Doesn't God know how, who will be saved and who will be lost? At the part of great, the great controversy between good and evil, the Bible says the Lucifer, who is a being who rebelled against God's, God's law, and lay the universe into disobedience. Let's read about him, the, the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Isaiah 14, ver, chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He says, I will all also sit in the mountain on the farthest side of the north. From the north, where God's law was given, Satan wanted to be a lawgiver. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer wanted to sit on God's throne. He rejects God's authority. He wanted to be his own ruler, to set opinions above God's sovereignty. Lucifer claimed that God was unfair. Lucifer laid a third angels into rebellion. And he came to the planet Earth and laid. Adam and Eve injecting God's love and authority. Because before the universe, Lucifer has charged God is unfair. God is not righteous. God is, God is not honest. He doesn't want us the best. God's laws can't be kept. So God is on trial before his own universe. The heavenly records reveal God's justice. Before God wipes sin out of this universe, his love and fairness and justice should be shown to the universe. Universe will love is so much that he has done every possible thing for every human being on this planet that you and I are evidence on trial as our lives become before God in the judgment. God asked, could I have done anything more to save you? It will be evident that Anybody who is lost is not because God did not give a chance. It is not because God, God did not love them. It's not because God did not desire their happiness. Their choices. The choice to reject God's love, justice, sovereignty, and authority. They wanted to be their own gods. God created the human race, not a cosmic speck of dust, but as an individual's. God created everyone, every one of us, with the capacity to choose to make a rational and moral choices. The Bible says, judgment calls us for an account. How, how, how we have used that power of free will that God has given us. Whether you are saved or lost, it is in your heart. It is in your cho choice. It is not hereditary. It's not in the environment. It's not a destiny, but it is determined by our choices that we make. The Bible teaches us the reality of the judgment. If we read Romans 14, 12, the Bible says, so then each of us shall, shall give account of himself to God. The Bible teaches that the reality of judgment, everyone one day will be giving an account of himself to God. The Solomon wrote in Ec Ecclesiastes 11.9, Rejoice, O young man, let cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. The Bible teaches the magnitude of universality of the judgment. Every human being has a case at the court of God. We are responsible for the choices, actions, and decisions. The judgment reaches into our personal lives. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God will bring 
asking everyone, looting every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Nothing secret with God. Double lives, double standard, exposed before the searchlight of a holy God. You may hide something from your wife, but it cannot be hidden from God. You may hide something from your, your husband, but it cannot be hidden from God. You can hide something from your coworker, from your friend, from your relative, from anyone, but not from God. It will break into in every secret thing, in your private moments. What are you reading? What are you watching? In your innermost soul, what do you really love? The Bible says, Hebrew 4, 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In the judgment, no pretense, no shame. You may look decent on one side and appear moral with a fancy suit and briefcase. If you are doing dishonest deals, remember, and open to God. We appear before the judgment of God, not as, not as we pretend to be, but as we actually we are who we are, not with the disguise, but dressed in truth for all to see. Once, if we read Psalms 139, verse 1 and 3, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know, you know me. You are familiar with all my ways. All ways for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. Bible says, you have searched me, O oh God. How will you stand in the judgment? Is there a greed, lust, selfishness in your heart? How will you stand before God? You say, I cannot make it in that judgment. God knows everything, thought, words, and deeds, and actions. If we read Matthew 12, 36, and 37, it says, But I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, they will give an account of it in the day or by all oh, by your words you will be justified by your words you will be condemned bible says words are bright brought into judgment in the bible words are very important moses spoke angry words he became angry and his mouth rock with angry word against the stubborn people couldn't enter the promised land with israel god forgave him angry words but it cost him so dearly Peter denied his Lord with a curse word. Pilate lost his soul, refused to act on evidence. His critical words, he washed his hand and condemned Jesus to death. What about Judah's tragic words of betrayal? Judgment reveals our thoughts, actions, and words. How can you and I pass this judgment? How can we have hope in the judgment? If you and I have a to stand before God, no way that we can pass. We will all be lost. There must be the encouraging message of judgment. Our Bible helps us. And, and it describes in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. It reads, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. The good news of the judgment, everything is recorded, not only bad, bad deeds. Also kind, loving words are recorded. Positive, so are words of encouragement spoken to others are recorded. There are words of hope spoken to others are recorded. Words of courage, all recorded in God's record. That unselfish act of kind is recorded. Those words of faith, praying with someone, leading somebody to Jesus, all are recorded in heaven's book. In addition for judgment to be, to be fair, must not only record good and bad deeds. Also, the difficulties, something about tears of our life. The Bible says in Psalm 56, 8, record my lament or my sorrow. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Every tear, every shed, 
due to a failed problem or situation in our life are recorded. Every tears that we shed over our children are recorded. Every sorrow experience, lonely, it's all recorded there. God knows the difficult circumstance in our life. God knows our poverty, sorrows, and tears. The battles, the struggles, joys, and sorrow, the good and bad deeds, strip aside from the disguise. Taken away that me, just me, the really me, the genuine me, authentic me that comes up before God's throne. You ask, how can I pass that judgment? It is good deeds way that in God's court, nothing is further from truth. Let's look at the God's book of record. There is one book in particular to be sure. Sure, there are book, good deeds and bad deeds are recorded. These reflect who we are and reflect our decisions and our choices. Here is the most important book that is mentioned in all of the Bible. A book, if your name is written in it, this is book stays in it. You will be saved forever. If your name is not in it, you will be lost forever. In of Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, the Lamb's book of life. This is Jesus' book. Those who will be living forever, according to the Bible, only two classes, those who will be saved and those who will be lost. Today, some are totally for Christ. Others are totally against Christ. The great majority is between undecided. According to the revelation, the middle class is going one way or other. The Bible says there will be the final harvest. Revelation 22, 11, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Two classes, just and unjust, the righteous and unrighteous. The large middle class is not yet decided. Now is making a decision. Is a for against Christ following Jesus or the beast in the last days? No other alternative. Either we have to surrender to the beast, allegiance to God or allegiance to the beast. Psalms 69 28 says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, not be written with the righteous. Those who refuse the claims of Jesus, who reject Jesus Christ, the Bible says, will be blotted out from the book of the living. In Revelation 3, 5, adds, he who overcomes those who accept Christ as their redeemer shall be clothed in white garments. From the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He said, I appear before God with my last pride, greed and showing my sins, then I'm blotted out from his book forever and lost. Or I appear before God and record of my life is there. And Jesus steps forward. This is one of mine. Yes, he fell, he sinned. But Father, my blood shed to pardon his sin. By faith, he was in me. When I pardon is written after everything. My sins do not appear before God before heavenly beings, the plain truth is every one of us will appear before the judgment of God's court. But how can I know I will pass the judgment? How can I be confident that I will pass this judgment? How can I be sure, no, that when, I, when my name comes before God, when the final judgment is decided I'm saved, the verdict, the verdict will be forgiven. When the sun's in a holy glass, time run out. How can I be sure in heaven with God forever? I sin. I certainly can't do it in my own. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rocks. All my good deeds are not sufficient to pass the judgment. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Nobody can pass the judgment alone. Nobody 
we can pass at least God's law condemn us. It is not only enough to say, do not kill. It also says, just if you get angry, it is the same as killing. Not, do not commit adultery. It also says, do not even lust, which is equivalent to committing adultery. Are we pure? Are you pure? We can't pass the judgment unless we come to the cross and we accept Christ's perfect life. God loved us, he saved us, so that in that judgment, the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be presented in our behalf. Christ steps forward and says in John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from this into life. In the judgment, it is not good deeds against bad deeds. It's about Jesus. His promise is beautiful. In Hebrews 7, 5, all who save the uttermost, those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them, can Jesus enable us to pass the judgment? Yes, he is able to save us. To those who come to God through him. Only once, only those who won't be saved are those who do not come to God through Jesus Christ, who failed and who cursed, stole, and commit adultery, or maybe he, I am a respectable sinner, but he is able to save to the uttermost that come to God by him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. When my name comes up before God, there is a catalog of my sin. Jesus says, Father, you sent your spirit to his heart. Father, you loved him and I died for him. I intercede. He broke the law, but I kept the law. He deserved this, but I deserve life. Father, credit everything in my account to him. All the angels sing, Jesus has never another man, another man's come with a lie, with the cheating, with the stealing. But he never came to Jesus and asked God, did I do everything I could do to save him, says God. And when the records are checked, yes, reach out in love and mercy. And he couldn't do anything more. God has done all that for every one of us. The Bible says, 1 John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus the Christ, who is the righteous. Yes, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, one who represents us and has never lost the case. When life comes to an end, on a bed count, does it make any difference? Only one thing counts, is my life in Christ. That's the most important decision in our life that we should have. Are in their sins, are you clinging to is there anything that we won't surrender? God can't forgive sin because I choose to hold on to it and because I won't confess it. And only as I repent and confess and open my heart can I have or can he, Jesus, judgment are. The Bible says time is short in Revelation 22, 20, 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. And our decision now is settled our, our destiny. And may God bless you, and happy Sabbath. Let's, let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, you know our heart and our life. Lord, as we open our heart, and as we allow ourselves And as we for sins, and we choose Jesus, who stands on that great judgment day, and who has never lost the case. You know our decision in our heart. May it be a decision that will make us winners on that judgment day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and happy Sabbath to you all. Bye. Thank you, Marcos. Happy Sabbath, everyone.